Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by J Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine show right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. My name is Mike Avery, and I look forward to this time sitting here in the studio for three hours behind this microphone talking about the outdoors, the great outdoors here in the great state of Michigan and occasionally beyond. And another reason I look forward to being in the studio today is <laughs> it's air conditioned. <laughs> it has been a little warm, hasn't it? A little warm, a little muggy, a little miserable, which is kind of what we expect from August. The other day I was out uh, mowing the yard in the middle of the day. Don't ask me why I did it in the middle of the day, Avery. Why didn't you wait until the evening? Which was bad enough. And then I went out and shot my new bow in the middle of the day as well. And I thought I was going to melt into the grass. I have not. This is the second week in a row where I have been here in the studio and have not been fishing since we last talked. There's something wrong with that, isn't there? There is. Because of, you know, I was telling you last week I had some projects around the house. That's, that's pretty well wrapped up. Now I am getting ready for a bear hunt in White River, so I'm doubling up on my workload, and I just don't have time. But I feel like I'm not missing much, because my friends who have been out there on Saginaw Bay say it has indeed really slowed down. But if the east side of the state, the walleye fishery has slowed, the salmon fishing on the west side is on fire. I'm sure you've heard this by now, but we've had two really big stories coming out of the outdoors here in Michigan in the last week. The first one is we have a new state record king salmon, a Chinook salmon. That record has been in place since 1978. A guy caught a 47-pound and change king out of the Grand River in 1978, and that record has held since then, and I never thought in my wildest dreams that that record would ever be beaten. I keep expecting our state walleye state record to be beaten, but I never thought we'd get a new state record king salmon. Last Saturday, fishing out of Ludington, Bobby Sullivan, Charter Captain Bobby Sullivan on Icebreaker Charters had a crew out there, and they caught a 47-plus pound king salmon. Now think about this. If you've ever seen a 30-pound king, you know how big and impressive that fish is. I think the biggest one I've ever seen is 30 pounds, and it was a monster. And then you think of a 40-pound fish. I can't even imagine that. I used to hear about 40-pound fish out of Lake Ontario, and I thought, that's crazy. That's as big as a, I mean, you feel like it was a pig in the water. And they got a fish pushing 50 pounds. Wow. Wow. Now, congratulations to the angler on the end of the line, a young guy, Louis, Louise. And so he can say he caught a new state record king salmon, and it's probably going to hold for years. But let me, let me, and no disrespect to the angler, but I will tell you this. When you're fishing on a charter boat, it's the captain who caught that fish. He didn't have the rod in his hand, but it's the captain who caught that fish. Bobby Sullivan Congratulations, Captain Bobby Sullivan. Because it's the captain who decides where to fish, who decides what baits, who decides how deep to put them, who decides how fast to troll. 
the angler on a charter trip is reaps the benefits of the captain. So Captain Bobby Sullivan, congrats to you. Now Bobby is going to join me here on the Outdoor Magazine radio show after the break and tell the story. I'm excited to hear that. The other big news coming out of the outdoors here in Michigan this week. There was a wolf advisory committee or commission meeting in uh, the UP, I think it was Ishpeming, last week. And the big news to come out of that was a former DNR biologist named Kevin Swanson, who I have had here on the radio show before, made a statement in front of the commission that really raised some questions about, well, several things. And in essence, what Kevin says was that when he was a field biologist, he reported a certain number of wolves in an area based on his firsthand observation. He reported that to his supervisors in the DNR, and they didn't believe him, and they took those numbers out of the wolf survey. And Kevin was not really happy about that. Now, Kevin, I've talked to Kevin about this and asked him to be here on the show. He has declined. He said he's really not going to talk to anybody about it. He said he made his point and he's going to move on. Um, and in reality, the number, reality, reality, the numbers that Kevin's talking about are only, what, maybe five wolves? So we're not going to significantly skew the size of the Upper Peninsula wolf population based on the alleged underreporting of wolves in the area that Kevin Swanson was responsible for. But it does raise the bigger question about, okay, if it was happening in that area where a field biologist says he's got a certain number of wolves, reports it to his superiors, and they don't believe him, and they don't include those numbers, if that's happening in other areas as well, then you could significantly skew the guesstimate on the size of Michigan's UP wolf population. But regardless of actual hard numbers, the bigger question it raises in my mind is accountability and whatever happened, whatever happened, we voted on this. What was it, Proposal G, that all wildlife decisions in Michigan would be based on sound scientific information? And if you've got a field biologist who is making observations and reporting based on his experience and his time in the field to somebody up the food chain and they tell him basically to forget about it, you're wrong, what does that say? What kind of questions does that raise? So we haven't seen the end of this one, I'll tell you that. I will tell you that. Uh, so, so unfortunately, yeah, I can't get Kevin on the show, but I will have uh, Amy Trotter from MUCC coming up in the second hour. Amy was is is on the Wolf Advisory Committee, and she was at that meeting where Kevin made those statements. I want to get the reaction from MUCC on that. In the meantime, what else is going on? Oh, I did get my hands on a Darton Toxin 150 RD crossbow. I, uh, I've been going back and forth about whether to, to put down that beloved recurve that I'd been shooting for the last two and a half years. I love it. It is, it is archery as it's intended to be, in my opinion. It is pure, basic, simple, beautiful, instinctive, close up, close range, in your face, 15 yards or less, and I love it. But I felt lately like I wasn't as proficient with that tool as I should be to go in the woods and hunt a critter. And I just knew that I wasn't going to put the time into it required to get that level of proficiency back. So I thought, I'm going to take a look at a crossbow. Oh, I know, I know. Crossbows are evil. They're poacher's tools. Eh, No, they're not. Uh, And I thought, if I'm going to shoot 
um, a crossbow. I want it to be a Michigan-made crossbow. And I've got a long-standing relationship with the folks at Darton Archery. So I reached out to Ted Harpum and I said, hey, here's what I want to do. What do you think? And he says, I'll get a bow for you. And he actually sent me their top-tier bow. It's the 150. Now, I will tell you this. This is not a bow for a beginning crossbow shooter. In fact, after hunting with a recurve for the last couple of seasons, I will admit to being intimidated by this thing. It's got like a 220-pound draw, 440 feet per second. It's a lot of energy to have right there in front of your face. And I'm just, I'm not used to that after hunting with a recurve. But it's very, very impressive. And it reminded me of why people shoot crossbows. Because you can le- reach a level of proficiency quicker and easier. Maybe it's taken the easy way out. I, I, I can't argue with that. But if the goal, if the ultimate goal in any hunting situation is to make a quick, clean, humane killing shot, and a crossbow will allow you to do that, and in my case, my recurve, I didn't have the confidence I felt I needed, then why not? And that's what I'm going to be shooting here in a couple of weeks in uh, Ontario. Whether I will actually take a shot at a bear or not, I don't know. Coming up on this week's Outdoor Magazine show after the break, Bobby Sullivan, the charter captain who caught that state record king, Jay Wesley from the DNR, the guy who certified it, then an hour number two, uh, Scott Keatsman, a taxidermist, Amy Trotter of MUCC, and an hour number three, Richard P. Smith, talking about bears and whitetails, and we'll wrap it up with Chef Dave Miner. Oh, you can hear the Outdoor Magazine show on uh, lots of stations across the great state of Michigan, but I forgot to print out my list. (laughs) Oh, but we'll figure it all out. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Rapid River Knife Works. I've got a Rapid River Knife in my pocket right now. I'm telling you, it is the most beautiful, sharpest uh, piece of... uh, It's a piece of art that I use every day. You've got a knife in your pocket. You're going to use a knife all the time. Why not make it a Michigan-made knife? I like Rapid River Knives. Check out the website, RapidRiverKnifeWorks.com, RapidRiverKnifeWorks.com. And um, check out their uh, showroom in the uh, town of Rapid River as well. Very impressive. Uh, Chris Durson, is, is, uh, he's been around the knife industry for, what, 30, 40 years now. Uh, RapidRiverKnifeWorks.com. All right, I was saying in the first segment um, that this past week something happened here in Michigan that I never thought I would see. A new state record Chinook salmon, king salmon. The previous record had been in place since 1978, and that fish was more than 47 pounds, and I thought there's no way that record will ever be broken. Last weekend, Captain Bobby Sullivan of Icebreaker Charters, icebreakerfishingcharters.com, was trolling with some clients off Ludington, and he landed a king, one of his clients did, of more than 47 pounds. Now, Bobby, Captain Bobby, Captain Sullivan, was not the guy on the end of the rod. But, as I said in the first segment, when you are fishing with a captain, it's basically the captain who caught the fish, in my opinion. Because he took you to the spot, he chose the baits, he chose the speed, he chose the depth. So, Bobby Sullivan deserves to be recognized and deserves to be congratulated and he's on the outdoor magazine phone line right now to do just that captain welcome to the show and congrats well thanks mike i i truly appreciate it what (laughs) what how cool is this bobby oh it's uh the last day or two is finally starting to set in um uh on saturday it was pretty hectic with uh trying to run around get the fish on a official scale but it's an unbelievable feeling to have that fish get boated on my boat and lewis i mean it couldn't have happened without him he uh he listened to everything i said the first three four minutes of the fight was uh 
quite the battle of trying to uh, coach him through it. But once he settled down, I mean, he he did everything perfect. So, You've caught a lot of big kings over the years. Did you know just how big this fish was right away, or did it take you a few minutes to realize it? I knew it was big at the back of the boat. I didn't know it was 47 pounds big. Uh, there's probably a video floating around somewhere when I netted it, and I yelled, you know, over to Lewis, and I said, I, you don't realize what you just caught. This is a 40-pound salmon. Then the doubt started to set in 15, 20 minutes later after I had told a couple people. I got thinking, man, a 40-pound king is a really, really <laughs> big king. Uh, so I started doubting myself. Uh, but, you know, when we put it on the scale at Ray's, it, it reconfirmed that I knew it was a big fish. Bobby, a, a 30-pound king is huge. A 40-pound to me is inconceivable. A fish pushing almost 50, I, 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 I didn't think there were any kings out there that size still. Yeah. It makes you think what else is out there. You know, I called uh, last year we had a 31 get boated on my boat. We had a couple 29s. And I called the guy, he was one of my buddies that caught the 31. And I told him, I said, we just caught a fish that it's a lot bigger than the one you got last year. And he said, how big is it? And I said, probably pushing 40. So hmm. the thing was a giant. So how, was how, how long really, did it take from the time you hooked up? Well, let me back up. Was this a first light thing or was this later in the morning you hooked up on this fish? Uh this was right during that prime time bite. It wasn't in the dark, but it was that that first hour, that witching hour. I set up on the outside of the pack because it was really busy up at the point, and I was kind of regretting my decision of going up there, and I didn't want to play right on the shelf, so I set up in probably 180, 200. That way, if I needed to, I could have just put it on a west troll and got out of there. And the first, I had... A, I had probably eight or nine rods set before that fish bit. And once it once it was hooked, I didn't think it was that big of a fish. It was just taking out lines slow and steady, but it took line for 15 minutes and it didn't <laughs> stop. You know, it wasn't one of those burners that it hits and it just screams for 30, 40 seconds and comes in a little bit, goes back out. This one did one long run. And Lewis did a great job. And once he started gaining line on it, I don't think it took very much line after that. It wore itself out on that first run. Did you ha did you turn around and chase it? Or, or was it no, not possible with your spread? I was running pretty quick when I was setting up. I always, was setting lines, I always start going fast so I can get everything out. Then I kind of slow the boat down. I didn't have a chance to slow the boat down yet. And once that fish started taking line and I knew it had three, 400 feet of backing out on that board rod, I, I put the one motor down about as slow as it would go. And we were probably doing one seven, one six, just uh, trying to not horse the fish too much. What? Uh... Very rarely back down on a fish. You know, I knew that fish had just a ton of backing out and I needed to slow down. Was this uh, copper wire lead core? What 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 were you what, what were you fishing? This was on a it's a weighted steel. It's just light copper. It's a little bit user or uh, more user friendly than copper is. Uh, a lot of us have been starting to switch over to it on Saginaw Bay instead of running lead core. Uh, Captain Jason Graham's been doing a great job helping everyone with the termination kits and everything. He's been tying a special knot instead of using a termination kit. So he's one of my good buddies. He's actually docked right next to me in, uh, in Ludington right now, and he's re-rigged probably 10 of my uh, board rods for salmon fishing right now. You mentioned Saginaw Bay. Here's the funny part. A lot of people know you as a Saginaw Bay walleye guy. You go to the west side of the state, and look what you did. <laughs> yeah. I've been going to Ludington for, oh, ever since I was a little kid. We used to always go over for the month. Uh, and I've chartered over there the last five years for the month of August. I uh, do river trips in the West Side Rivers during the month of September. So I'm probably, 
Uh, not many people know me over there. Uh, they do now. I think they kind of do now. Yeah, yeah. they do now. Um, you say it's kind of set in in this last couple of days. Um, I, I got to ask you this, and I, you know, I asked you this off air earlier. My buddy Tim Roller, whose client caught a world record brown a few years ago, almost immediately people started talking trash about it and saying how it wasn't legit, yada, yada, yada. Have you heard anything along that line, Bobby, about your experience? For the most part, it's all been positive. Good. Everyone's been very supported. I have seen a few a few comments on Facebook or some other uh, publications, but that really hasn't seemed to bother me. A lot of Wonderful. people are saying I was trying to take credit for it, and obviously there's no way I was trying to do that. Um, but other than that, it's been very supportive. The town of Ludington, captains I don't even know over there came over and congratulated me. Uh, everyone watched the live weigh-in, so they saw the support we had. Uh, Captain Chucks, I mean, hats off to them. Uh, it's the finest salmon fishing store ever that I've ever been into, and they were supported from the minute I called them on the phone. Bobby, this is obviously great news for you. It's great news for Lewis, but you know what? It's great news for the state of Michigan, and it's great news for the Lake Michigan salmon fishery. I mean, this this goes beyond, in in my opinion, this goes beyond just a big fish on a Saturday morning. This, like, raises the bar and gets people excited again. Yes. Yes, it does. And I can add to that. I've had uh, hundreds of phone calls the last few days, so if I haven't gotten back to anyone, I've been trying to in my spare time. I've had people call from Missouri, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, all wanting to book trips. <laughs> it's and good for, good for business, I everyone, bet. <laughs> my availability for the end of the month, I only had one or two open spots, and those got booked right away. But what I've been telling everyone, you can get on to uh, the Ludington Charter Boat Association or the Michigan Charter Boat Association and find a captain. Uh, but it's, it's amazing how nationwide this went. Wow. And it's like you say, it's great for the town of Ludington, great for Michigan, because all eyes are on us right now with the fishery. And we keep producing big kings. I was just looking at the the leaderboard for the Bonanza. I think third place, just uh, there was a new third place fish. And to be in the top eight places, you have to have uh, 29 and a half pound or bigger to be on the leaderboard. This is like this is like the good old days of big kings. Yes. Except that we've got one almost 50 now, a new state record, and it was caught on your boat. Yep. We're uh very thankful. Well, and you and and proud too, Bobby, you should be uh, yeah, very, very proud. Very proud. Yeah. Well, listen, you've been around the fishing industry your entire life. Uh, your dad helped start the uh, Flint Steelheaders years ago. You're actively involved in Walleye for Warriors. So you're obviously a, a good guy, and everybody says this is well-deserved. I will send people to your website, icebreakerfishingcharters.com. Don't expect to book a trip on Lake Michigan this season. But, Bobby, you're taking uh, river trips this fall? Yeah, I, I have a, a few days open right now on the river then once i'm done on the river uh the first week of october i start duck hunting i run duck hunting trips then once january comes i start fishing for steelhead in the rivers all the way in through the end of april then i'm on saginaw bay for a couple months well good for you again congrats uh thanks for being so accessible during this time when everybody wants to talk to you bobby and uh uh, I, I appreciate you talking to me and continued good luck to you. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, I'd just like to say before we leave, you know, congratulations again to Lewis. Uh, thanks to the whole town of Ludington, uh, Captain Chucks, and Jay Wesley for coming up there. It was uh, an honor to finally get to meet him, and it was cool watching him uh, look over one of the fish that I had just put in my boat he's actually on the show coming up next bobby again congrats bobby sullivan captain bobby sullivan of icebreaker uh, fishing charters.com one of his clients caught a new state record chinook salmon 47 pounds and change jay wesley coming up after the break
Charlie's like, talk, Avery, talk. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by the Linwood Beach Marina and Campground. Linwood Beach can be your year-round Saginaw Bay fishing destination and your mid-Michigan tracker and angler quest headquarters. Uh, Linwood Beach still very busy, although the walleye fishing there on Saginaw Bay has slowed down a little bit, as it traditionally does this time of year. Thank goodness the salmon fishing on the west side of the state and, and, you know, northern Lake Huron, too. Let's not forget that. This is the time of year to be fishing for big kings, as we talked about in the previous segment with Captain Bobby Sullivan of uh, Icebreaker Charters, who caught that, knew his client, not Bobby. I want to make this very clear, and Bobby wants to make it very clear. He was not the guy on the rod, but as, as I said, if somebody catches a fish with a charter captain, I'm saying it's the captain who was responsible for it. Bobby Sullivan was talking about a DNR fisheries biologist, Jay Wesley, who showed up and certified that fish. Well, Jay is on the Outdoor Magazine phone line with us right now. He is a DNR fisheries biologist. He is the coordinator for the Lake uh, Michigan, um, uh, the, the, uh, the basin coordinator. And uh, I wanted to get his reaction to this all, and he has graciously ad- agreed to give us some time. Jay, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. It's been an exciting few days. <laughs> I, I bet that's an understatement. So tell, walk me through the story. I heard a report that you were out working in your garage that morning, and you got a phone call and told your wife, I got to go. There's something I got to see. <laughs> that's exactly right. It was uh, Scott at Captain Chuck's called me, and he says, man, we got a big fish here. And I can totally trust Scott when he says that. And uh, so I... I literally just jumped in the car and steady, started heading up. I was pretty confident that they had a state record. Oh, so you knew at that time that this was a, a fish of this size? Yeah. He said it was 47 plus, which was uh, a pound over the state record. So if it was that on his scale, which I think is pretty accurate, I, I was pretty sure it was going to be that or something bigger on a certified scale. Jay, that record has, you well know, has been in place, had been in place since 1978. Did you ever think it would be broken? Certainly not. Not, not given the ups and downs that Lake Michigan's had uh, the past uh, 40 years. So, boy, um, it's pretty exciting and hopefully a sign for the future of the lake. So when you pull up there, what is your job? Do you first of all have to verify that it is indeed a king, a Chinook? Yeah. First, I had to make my way through the crowds because there was a lot of people there waiting to see. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> I basically wanted to make sure that it was a king salmon. So I look at the gums, make sure they're dark, look at the spotting, look at the spotting on the tail, make sure there's spots on the upper and lower lobes. Also look at the anal fin, the shape, did an anal ray count. It was 16, and Chinooks are usually around 15 to 17. So all that checked out to be uh, Chinook salmon. Uh, second thing I do is, is verify the weight. So I have to look at um, where they went to get the weight of the fish, make sure that scale has been certified. And it had been. It was just certified uh, this May um, so that all cleared. So, um, and then just make sure we got all the information from the, the angler. So it was actually a pretty easy job. They had a lot of that stuff ready for me when I got there. Is there any, um, I, I, I first thing I wondered a, a few years ago, you guys had this, uh, program and I think it was called triploid where you had Kings out there that didn't sexually mature, so they didn't run the rivers, and they stayed out there an extra year and grew. Is there any chance that this is one of those fish? I think highly unlikely. That was almost 20 was years ago. Was it that ago. long ago? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we marked all those fish, and we only got a couple of back. And I think some were five. I think I recall one being seven years old. But it was only like 15 pounds. So we never saw giant Chinooks like we had hoped from a triploid fish. So then what is your best guess on this one? Did did this fish actually stay out there an an extra year, or did it just eat so much in those four years? 
I, my guess, and I don't know yet, but I think it just ate a lot in four years. Most of our Chinooks are returning at age two and three. Wild Chinooks sometimes take an extra year just because they're getting into the lake a little bit behind and not as uh, in good condition as hatchery fish. So it's it's most likely a four-year-old. We've only seen five-year-olds when growth was really bad. So the only way I think it would be a five-year-old if it started at uh, May 2016 wasn't good in Lake Michigan. In fact, we're quite worried about it. So maybe it just grew really slow its first year or two, and then things bounced back, and then it grew like gangbusters. Man. But, I guess so. I will, uh, go ahead, Jay. I, oh, I will add that um, once the taxidermist is done with what they have to do, we are going to get some vertebrae and get the head so we can we can do some aging of that fish. So we should be able to figure out exactly what the age was. Ah, that'll be interesting. Uh, we're talking with Jay Wesley, who is a, a fisheries biologist in the uh, Lake Michigan uh, Basin Coordinator uh, for the DNR. Uh, we've got to take a break here on the show, but uh, Jay can stick around. When we come back, I want to talk to him, not now specifically about this new state record fish, but about the health of of the Lake Michigan salmon fishery in general. Uh, And I think a new state record certainly points out that it's moving the right direction. And is it possible that there's an even bigger fish out there? Well, we'll ask him that and more after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Alpena on WZTK. That's 105.7 FM. In Battle Creek on WBCK 95.3 FM. And in Traverse City, 580 AM WTCM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by MUCC's On the Ground program. OTG is a program to improve habitat for fish and wildlife across the state. For details, check out the Michigan United Conservation Club's website. That's MUCC.org, MUCC.org. And a reminder, if you use the promo code MIKE, all caps, M-I-K-E, you can save 25% on your MUCC uh, membership. Right now, we're talking with uh, Jay Wesley, who is the uh, Lake Michigan Basin Coordinator with the Michigan DNR, michigan.gov slash DNR. Jay is the guy who certified that new state record king last weekend in Ludington. And again, Jay, for a guy who spent his career working with that resource, this has got to be very rewarding and very exciting. It certainly is, and that's why I had to jump right up and get in the car and get up there. That's that's a fish I wanted to see. It's a fish I wanted to touch. So. Mm. It's, it's quite rewarding. What uh, what does this say about the fishery right now? I mean, you, you you yourself talked about the ups and downs over the years. You guys in the department got some grief a few years ago about cutting back on the plants because um, you were concerned about the the the, uh, the forage base, the the fish that the big fish are eating. How are things going out there now? Well, I think we're in good balance and have really good healthy fish and that's you know we're seeing not only the state record but a fair amount of 30 pounders a lot of 20 pounders being caught so that that tells me that the fish are finding food food in various sizes not only small alewives but some bigger larger older alewives so that's good balance um on the flip side anglers are complaining that there aren't very many out there and i would agree with them our numbers of chinook are down um, so it's it's a choice we have to make as managers, you know, keep healthy fish out there, um, but then also manage expectations and have enough out there where people actually want to go out and try to fish for them. So it's a, it's a tough spot to be, and I think we're the pendulum swung where we're we're in that big fish category, not too many out there, and I think anglers would like us to kind of move more towards the the middle and and get a few more out there so they have better chances of catching fish. All right. Hearing you say that, you say you think the anglers would like you guys to do that. Will you listen? I mean, do you, how, how much do you guys take into account what the anglers are telling you and how much do you take into account the, the science that you're seeing out there? 
Yeah, uh, both. And I feel very good when we have big, healthy fish out there. So I know we have room to add a few more. Where I feel very uncomfortable is when we have a lot of small fish out there. Like you can't even get a 15-pounder and you can catch a limit of uh, 10 to 12 pounders. That's a bad situation to be in and and it's very risky. So I think we've swung into a position where, as a biologist, I'm very comfortable and we are adding more fish to the lake and um, are planning on adding a few more next year. Um, It's just how many many more do you add? So we'll be cautious and hopefully can continue the the streak of some bigger fish out there. You do have control over how many fish you stock in there, but the, but you don't really have any control over the bait fish population. So you're kind of at the mercy of Mother Nature there, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. We don't control bait fish, and we don't control wild chinook either. So that can swing up and down. And recently, wild production has actually been lower. So that, in combination with lower stocking, actually helped us get into this position. And probably we went farther than we were expecting in terms of lower Chinook numbers, higher Chinook weight. Any reason to believe that natural reproduction will ever produce enough fish where you won't have to put fish in, uh, for you guys won't have to put fish in, like they do over on Saginaw Bay these days? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Maybe not a great example, but Lake Superior is a good example. There's still a Chinook fishery there, and there's zero stocking. I think we could have the same on Lake Michigan, but it would really change the fisheries. Local ports that don't get uh, wild production from rivers won't have this kind of fall fishery. Um, and when things change, it'll take a long time for it to rebound. So I'm not sure. I think we could sustain, but it, there'll be winners and losers in terms of you know ports that get fish and ports that don't. So hopefully we can sustain with what we have now where we can sprinkle some fish at some port that don't have wild fish and everyone can get a shot of these fall returning fish. Jay, last question for you. Um, what do you think the odds are there's a bigger fish out there still swimming around? I mean, the odds that somebody would catch the biggest fish in the lake are probably statistically kind of slim, aren't they? Right. I think it's... Um, probably pretty low i'm not seeing many 40 pounders caught so this is kind of a a freak fish um it it takes special circumstances so something kept this fish out long enough so it didn't spawn like last year maybe it was a upper 30 pound fish last year and just didn't spawn for some reason so that's unusual um fishing efforts actually been somewhat down so maybe that gave it a chance to get bigger but usually big aggressive fish you know hit lures or whatever they can find all right jay but, listen uh, i listen i gotta let you go because i'm out of time but i appreciate you telling me uh the story it is very exciting the website michigan.gov slash dnr michigan.gov slash dnr we'll take a break for the top of the hour when we come back taxidermist scott keatsman if you catch one of these big kings what do you do with it in hour two of outdoor magazine Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by J Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polar Craft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to our number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show, right here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network. Outdoor Magazine radio is scheduled produced, recorded, and distributed primarily as a radio show across more than two dozen stations, AM and FM stations, here in the great state of Michigan. And I think the best way to listen, if you can, is on your local radio station. 
Get your no- uh, local news, weather, sports, and uh, our local radio stations get the content before the podcast is uploaded. And I, I, I make this distinction a lot lately because uh, the lines are really getting blurred between what is a radio show and what is a podcast. Everybody has a podcast, and I think podcasting is wonderful. I am very deeply involved in podcasting. But I do, i got to be honest, I I, I do take a certain amount of pride in having a statewide syndicated radio show because there aren't very many of them out there at all. And God has blessed me that Outdoor Magazine Radio is the biggest outdoor radio show in Michigan. So thank you. I, I thank you. God, again, for that, and I thank you for listening. If you can't hear Outdoor Magazine radio on your local radio station, it's nice to know there is a podcast, there's that word, the buzzword, podcast of the show. And what's the difference, really? Well, the content is the same. If you listen to it on your radio station, it's a radio show. If you listen to it anywhere other than on your radio uh, station, it's a podcast. You can hear the podcast version of the radio show on my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. You can also hear it on my Facebook page. You can hear it on Amazon Music. We're now on Audible. How cool is that? I listen to a lot of uh, uh, audiobooks on Audible, and the podcast of the Outdoor Magazine radio show is now there. It's on Twitter. Why? I don't know. But some people are still on Twitter. It's on LinkedIn, it's on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Player FM, Deezer, Odyssey, and I even put it on YouTube. I know, it's audio, it's sound, but I put it on YouTube and people consume the content there. Uh, I also do, speaking of podcasting, I also do monthly podcasts, and these are shows, this is content that, that does not appear anywhere on the radio. It is strictly podcasts. I do monthly uh, podcasts for Jay's Sporting Goods, now celebrating their 50th anniversary, by the way. Offshore Tackle, Angler Quest Boats, Killer Food Plots, Polar Craft Boats, and Shadow Hunter Blinds. And today, when we're done, Charlie, are you doing the podcast or is Pat? Are you, one of you is doing one, one doing the other, right? Okay. We will do uh, a Jay's podcast, and we'll do a Killer Food Plots podcast today as well. So keep an, keep an ear out and an eye out for those. It was uh, very fun for me to do the first hour of this week's show, talking with Captain, Captain Bobby Sullivan of Icebreaker Charters about his customer, Lewis, uh, catching that new state record king salmon. I actually made a mistake. I thought the previous record was 47 pounds and change. Uh, the previous record was actually only 46 pounds and change. And uh, Bobby came in with 47 pounds and change. The previous record since 1978. Wow. I never thought it would be broken. Now, the odds of that being broken again this year are pretty slim. But this time of year, the odds of you catching a big king salmon are the best they're going to be throughout the entire year. Also, we've got uh, bear season coming up. We've got the early youth season coming up. So it's a time of year that if you were going to be looking for the services of a taxidermist, you just might be looking for those services in the next few weeks or so. The thing about uh, taxidermy work is I look at it as a way of preserving memories. Yeah, you can take pictures, you can shoot video, and those are wonderful. But taxidermy work is it's art that you can hang on your wall and it reminds you of an adventure it doesn't have to be a big buck doesn't have to be a big bear doesn't have to be a big fish it could be your son or grandson or granddaughter's first fish first little spike buck it doesn't matter it's a way of preserving memories but you got to be careful because there are a lot of people out there who hang out a shingle and say they're a taxidermist and God bless them. I mean, and nothing against part-time taxidermists. Some of them are very, very good. But again, you got to be careful. Scott Keatsman of Linwood Taxidermy, uh, linwoodtaxidermy.com, is a full-time taxidermist. 
uh, when my buddy, our, when our mutual friend, R.J. Meyer, retired, he kind of handed the crown to Scott, and Scott has, uh, uh, he did a bare rug for me, and he will be the guy that does any future work for me as well, and I, I can recommend him. And he's with us now, in fact, on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Scott, welcome back to the show. How are you? Hey, good morning, Mike. How are you? I'm doing great. Listen, how summertime, this early part of summer, I'm thinking is probably, what, a slower time of year for you or, or not really? Well, it's slower as far as stuff coming in the door. Um, but a full-time shop like what we run here, is there's never a slow time. And that's a common misconception. People say, well, I'll drop my fish off when, you, when you're slow. There's never a slow time because right now it's uh, pretty much balls of the walls, uh, uh, getting stuff out the door, um, trying to get caught up for the upcoming uh, seasons, which are, as you mentioned earlier, right around the corner. Kind of getting that lump in my gut when you were talking. I'm getting kind of that lump in my gut <laughs> thinking, yeah, I got to get busy. <laughs> it's not far. <laughs> yeah. So, well, uh, do, yeah. Do, do you get a chance to get out and enjoy hunting and fishing adventures yourself? Or is it one of these things you got into this because you loved hunting and fishing and now you don't get to hunt and fish as much because you're tied up doing hunting and fishing related work? That's exactly it. I, I do make a little bit of time, not nearly what I used to. Um, I've got three kids now that are up and coming, and I enjoy taking them out. And as far as I'm concerned, they can shoot everything they want and catch everything they want. I'm getting older and more, just more enjoy being out there and sharing the experience. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I'll shoot a buck if it walks by me, you know, or you know, I'll wet a line if the opportunity uh, permits. I ain't got no problem doing that, but uh, um, certainly don't get out as much as I used to, for yeah, sure. No, I understand that. And you mentioned your kids coming up. I think that's kind of a a misconception too. That's uh, you know I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I, and I ask them, wait, are you going to mount that fish? Are you going to mount that deer or whatever? No, I'm waiting until I get a master angler, or I'm waiting until I get a true trophy. But in some ways, I think that misses the point, right? It doesn't have to be a book buck or a master angler fish to be worthy of preserving the memory. No, absolutely not. Uh, we've done everything from chipmunks to bluegills and sunfish four inches long, um, you know, right on up the ladder to big game African and things like that. Uh, but no, you know, this is the same thing. You think of the be and that's absolutely true. And and the worst thing to ask me is, I have customers come in and say, you know, is this worth mountain? <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> it's, it's not mine. We'll do whatever. But, uh, you know, you have to justify that in your head. And, and what is the meaning of what we're going to, you know, what you're going to spend your money on and put on the wall? If I'm a taxidermist standing in my shop and a guy walks in and says, is this worth mounting? I'm, of course, going to tell him, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've, I've never been the type, yeah, <laughs> but I've never been the type to, uh, you know, talk somebody into something sure, either. Sure. Um, I'm not out to take your money. Um, you know, if you want to talk about the trophy, whether it's big enough, small enough, let's talk about that. But I'm not going to tell you whether to do it or not. Yeah. Um, you know, we've done everything. So. Well, and, and you talked about African animals. What's the most exotic or the most interesting mount you've done, Scott? Oh, gosh. Uh, crocodiles and alligators will test your patience. There's no doubt about that. Um, we've done a few of those. Um, uh, I've helped some people with some giraffes. A lot of us taxidermists will get together and tag team a, a large project. Um, you know, so I've, we've, I've worked on everything from elephants, giraffes, uh, life-size zebras. I've got a life-size lion uh, in my shop right now. Mm. Um, so, yeah, pretty cool stuff. Your shop uh, in Linwood, the uh, website linwoodtaxidermy.com, correct? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah we opened up uh, the brand new shop here a year and a half ago. Uh, right at the light on Linwood Road and M13. It's been great. Hey, real quick before this segment ends, um, what effect did COVID had on you? That must have been tough because I got a feeling, even though pe people were out, maybe they were looking more closely at their dollars. Uh, surprisingly, uh, a lot of people were hunting and fishing. We uh, we had probably one of our best years. Excellent. Um, now the downfall of the COVID is suppliers were shut down, tanneries were shut down periodically. Um, getting getting supplies and getting product back in a fashionable manner um, was was the bigger 
uh, delay and still is. This is going to go on for, it, now it's building more and more. It's going to go on, I see it, for a year or two. Mm. Hang tight, Scott. i got to take a break here. When we come back, I want to ask you about turnaround times on mounts. I want to ask you about how do we uh, maintain these mounts so we can pass them down for generations. And more importantly, what do we do in the field? Okay, so you catch this 30-pound king or this big king, or you shoot this bear, or your grandchild shoots their deer during the youth hunt. What do you do in the field to make the job easier for the taxidermist? That's coming up in the second segment of Hour 2 on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in uh, Tawas on WIOS, AM and FM, 1480 AM, 106.9 FM. You can hear us in St. Joe on WSGM, 94.9 FM. And you can hear us in the Sioux on ESPN, 1400 WK and Hopefully, we'll be passing through the Sioux. Didn't think I was going to be able to. Passing through the Sioux in a couple of weeks on the way to uh, White River, Ontario, Canada. On a bear hunt, I've something in the back of my mind is still like, oh, it's going to go south. They're not going to, you know, but I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Boning Archery. Michigan-based Boning has been a leader in the archery industry for 75 years. They are celebrating their 75th anniversary. What a tremendous accomplishment that is to not only just keep your doors open for 75 years, but to continue to innovate come up with new products, new gear for target archers and bow hunters. Congrats to everybody at Michigan-based Boning Archery. The website, boning.com. That's B-O-H-N-I-N-G.com, boning.com. While you are online, please check out my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Then head on over to LinwoodTaxidermy.com. That's the website of, obviously, Linwood Taxidermy. Scott Keatsman is uh, the man who owns it, the taxidermist there. Um, Scott, um, what can we do in the field to not only make your job easier, but more importantly, from our perspective, to um, get the best mount, whether it's a fish? Let's talk about fish first. So we, we get a big king or a big pike or a big muskie or whatever, we got it in the boat. We think, man, this is a big fish. I'm going to get this mounted. What do we do? Well, a lot of times you're in, you know, out in the middle, miles and miles out in the middle of a lake, and your only option is a cooler with ice, which is a great option, uh, you know, considering the situation. Um, so the best thing you can do is just do your best not to beat up the fins too bad, uh, poke holes in it, uh, rip any more holes in the skin than you absolutely have to by throwing fish on top of it. Um just treat it with care. Treat, treat it like a trophy. Um, and uh, when you get it back to shore, you know, um, handle it as little as possible. Uh, don't be throwing it in and out of coolers. Uh, put it in its final resting spot and leave it there until you can either get directly to your taxidermist or get to a freezer. And if you can get to a freezer, do not cut the fish. Don't cut the head off. You know, take your photos of it. Uh, get your weight, your length, your girth, and all that um, so you have those recorded. Uh, we prefer you to wrap it in a wet towel, kind of what I call a burrito, make a burrito, fish burrito out of it, slide it into a garbage bag and get it frozen solid um, as soon as possible. Uh, that's the best I can advice I can give you for any fish. Uh, if you can't get it in immediately to a taxidermist, um, get it frozen solid in a wet towel. And what that wet towel will do is while it's in the freezer, uh, it will prevent not 100%, but it will delay uh, freezer burn. And also, while it's thawing out, that wet towel will keep moisture into the skin and keep the fins and stuff from drying out. I'm thinking like on my Angler Quest, I've got a live well, which really does a great job of keeping fish alive, keeps them healthy, keeps the color good. But, you know, if you're fishing salmon or something, you don't have a live well big enough for that. But the minute you throw a salmon in the cooler on ice, it's going to start to change the coloration of that fish, though, Scott. Yep, yep, that's not a big deal. That's what we do. Uh, you're going to get ice burns on it. Um, you know, the color is going to fade. Um, that's not a huge deal. There's nothing you can do about that. Um, uh, it's more of preservation of the fish at that point. We're going to come through and take the insides of that fish right out 
And the only thing we're going to have left is the skin and the fins. And we're going to stretch that onto a uh, foam body. And the, the, everything is going to fade out to a dark grayish, brownish grayish color anyways. And then we're going to come through and repaint it and get all that color back into it. So the um, only so, thing you use is the skin and the scales yep. and, and the head? Yeah, we don't even use the heads on trout anymore. Um, we put artificial heads on them, and the reason we do that is because of the grease and the oils that are in trout. Um, it's just proved over time that, uh, you know, you have issues with seepage. Uh, if you look at some of the skin you hanging on the wall, I'm sure a lot, a number of people have them. If they have the original head on them, you see like a brown, goldish-colored oil seeping out of the gills and out of the jaw and the head and around the eyes. Uh, that's only out of the original head that made it to the surface. Um, so we just eliminate that and uh, that problem, and we put an artificial head on it. So you'll get back. It'll be your fish to scale to size, um, but really all we use is the skin and the fins. People ask me this all the time, and I, I guess I, I'm, you know, I catch enough fish where I don't think it's a big deal. But for people who don't catch a lot of fish and love to eat fish, they say, look, if I get that fish mounted, if I take it to a taxidermist, do I still get to eat the meat? Well, that's a that's a great question, and what's really booming here now, and it's probably just in the last four to five years, is reproductions. Um, that's why I say uh, said earlier, get your length, girth, and weight measurements. And girth, I mean the widest part of the fish. Um, and then you can bring those measurements in, and we can make a reproduction fish for you out of fiberglass. And that is indefinite. Um, there is no, we get no scale lift, no shrinkage. Um, everything is there of your fish, and they are beautiful. And we, we're probably up in our rep- doing reproductions probably 75 80% right now. Really? Um, yeah, people are really on to this, uh, this reproduction thing. And maybe other taxidermists, and I know there's some that that's all that we'll do is reproductions. Um, we still do a, quite a few skin mounts, and, uh, but we're doing fewer and fewer. Uh, people are either releasing the fish or keeping it and eating it, and we're doing reproduction. How, um, what, is, what is that? Fiberglass, carbon, graphite? What's that made out of? Yeah, they mold them out of fiberglass. They're molded out of fiberglass, and they're cast right off of your fish. And, uh, yeah, they, they look great. They come out. I mean, there's, like I said, no shrinkage. Um, uh, the fins are nice and thick like they should be. They got some body to them. They got some meat and some mass to them. Um, they look great. How do they compare price-wise to a standard uh, skin mount? Uh, they're typically a little bit more, uh, depending on the size of the fish. Your versus us, the price of a skin mount, you're usually a hundred to two hundred more for a reproduction. Um, but what you're getting for that hundred or two hundred bucks? I mean, when you're talking to king salmon, I mean, you're you're getting into eight hundred to a thousand dollar fish. Um, once you get, in my eyes, once you get up there, what's another couple hundred dollars for something that's going to last? You know indefinitely on the wall and, and be a beautiful specimen forever and ever. See, that was my next question. How long can we expect these to last? I mean, obviously, a reproduction is going to last, well, yeah. forever. But yep. uh, a fish mount or a deer or a bear, I mean, it, is, it, it costs us a few bucks to get it done, but is this something that's going to be around for the next generation? Nowadays, with today's products, um, in, in what we do today, I mean, I'm looking right now as I'm talking to you to a walleye that I mounted in 1992 that was caught out of the Saginaw River. It looks great. It, it does. Um, nowadays, bear mounts, deer mounts, fish mounts, even skin mounts um, should last a lifetime, t- provided that the owner takes care of them, uh, which means keep them out of direct heat, direct sunlight, uh, don't hang them above a wood stove. You know, there's there's a process there to to making them making that happen. But with our synthetic pans nowadays, um, and the products we use, uh, they should. I mean, you should get easily 40, 50 years out of a deer wow. head easily. I got a bunch of mounts at my place, fish mounts and um, um, critter mounts, and we've done uh, some projects the last uh, lately. So I've got. I got the dust, a lot of sawdust that is settled on these things. What's the best way to, to clean these things up without hurting them? Yeah, again, uh, treat them like a trophy. Um, I don't use any chemicals, um, for, you know, provided there's no smoke stains or anything like that. Um, I don't use any chemicals, just a, a feather duster or a damp rag and uh, some Q-tips to get down in the nooks and crannies and stuff. 
um, big animals, you know, furry animals, bears and bobcats and things like that, mountain lions. Um, if done and done correctly, which is very important, um, you should be able to take an air hose to them, you know, 25 pounds of air, 35 pounds of air out of a compressor and just lightly kind of dust them off. Or even uh, they make those air cans now you can buy at the hardware store, uh, you know, aerosol blow air cans. Um, blow the dust off them and brush them back out with the grain. You always go with the grain of the hair. And, uh, you know, some Q-tips around the eyes to get the dust off the eyes and whatnot. Um, it should be fairly simple maintenance, just no chemicals. Things like Pledge and Windex and things, All they got oils in them, and they will collect more dust than you'll ever get rid of. Well, I, I got to make a confession, and you may cringe <laughs> when you hear me say this. I run a vacuum over my bear rugs. Again, I don't have a problem with that. If they were tanned and tanned properly, they should handle that. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yep. Well, yep. between you and RJ, I mean, I know they're done by two quality guys. Well, hey, I don't know about that RJ guy. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> you That's a good point. <laughs> you talked about him passing the crown earlier, but I, I will say I never put it on my head because I wouldn't put anything on my head that he's had on his. So. Oh, that's a good point, too. I'm going to send him this excerpt. <laughs> hey, um, before we let you go, uh, we talked about fish. What about you know deer season coming up? A small game coming up, bear season coming up. What do we do in the field uh, with a mammal to make your job easier? Yeah, it's looking like right now it's going to be another warm one, um, and that's the killer is is warm. Uh, so your biggest thing with mammals, uh, especially bears, is uh, what I've always said: cold and dry. Somehow um, you got to get them cool, skinned and cooled. And, and keep them dry. Now, now that means if you have to put a deer cape on ice or a bear hide on ice, uh, cool it first and then put it in a garbage bag and then put it on top of ice to keep it cold. Um, but dry is, is more important than anything. Water promotes bacteria. And I see so many people come in in the fall with their bear that they put in their cooler and they got blocks of ice in there and their bear is just soaking with blood oils and residue in the bottom of their cooler um you're already playing with fire at that point um so dry and cool um lay them out 80 degree weather laid out with air circulating around it is better than a 120 degree bear rolled up in a black garbage bag in a cooler gotcha um get air around it let it cool down all right, Scott, good advice as always i'll send people to your website linwoodtaxidermy.com that's linwoodtaxidermy dot com have a good season and you and i will be talking again soon thank you mike appreciate it and you also all right uh, we'll take a break here in the outdoor magazine show when we come back amy trotter the executive director of mucc uh, she's been out of the office but i just found out she was actually catfish noodling down south with uh lori card of wild card outdoor adventures this is where they duck under the water reach their hands into crevices and pull catfish out no, thank you. But I want to talk with her about the uh, Wolf Advisory Committee and the statement that came up there from uh, retired bi- biologist Kevin Swanson. Also, if we have time, I want to get her opinion on the fact that COVID is showing up in Michigan whitetails after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Sandusky on WMIC, 660 AM, 95.3 FM. In Muskegon on WKBZ, 1090 AM. And let's go to Newberry, WNBY, 1450 AM. Uh, I was telling you before that, uh, well, uh, I, I knew I was going to have somebody from MUCC on, uh, MUCC, Michigan United Conservation Clubs. I thought it was going to be Amy Trotter, but it, actually it's Nick Green, their chief information officer. And Nick, I appreciate your uh, time this morning. I wanted to follow up um, on some news that came out last week, a statement that was made in front of the Wolf Advisory Committee by a uh, former Michigan DNR biologist, uh, Kevin Swanson, uh, he said he he put some numbers out there about the size of the wolf herd in his district, and his supervisors disregarded that. 
to me, that seems pretty significant, but I'd like to get your input on it. Yeah, I think the first thing we need to remember is that there are two sides to a story. Um, So saying that his supervisor disregarded it, you know, we don't know if that's the case. We don't know the process by which those minimum population counts are taken. Um, You know, we don't know how they're audited. We don't know how they are then sent back down to Lansing. Uh, These are all things, you know, questions that we have that just haven't hasn't been answered. So, you know, everyone right now is kind of in the middle of these two sides claiming different things. Um, But I think at the end of the day, when the information comes forward, uh, there's probably not going to be this, you know, it's it's just really hard to say right now what is going to happen. And from an MUCC perspective, uh, we're focused on the task at hand, which is getting a durable delisting in whatever way we need to do that. Um, So this is kind of, you know, lit a fire under some folks and has kind of caused concern. And and you're right, if it is correct, uh, if if the former biologist is, you know, spot on and there, you know, there is some nefarious activity, then, yeah, it needs to be dealt with. uh, And that is something we would certainly support. Um, But I think we just don't know what we don't know right now. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. But I do think that I look at MUCC as one of the groups that would be um, it would be appropriate for you guys to be folks looking into this further as an as an outside agency. I mean, do, do you see that as your role? Do you, do you do you even have the resources to do something like that, Nick? I mean, Mike, we don't have biologists on staff. We don't have lawyers on staff. Um, you know, those are the two, the two main uh, folks that are needed to kind of sort this all out. So while we will certainly work kind of the back rooms with policy and talk with folks and, and you know, understand and make sure that processes are brought forward and we're, we're looking at the right information, you know, we're just, <laughs> we aren't lawyers and we aren't biologists. Uh, we aren't the ones who are going to be presenting that information. So I've had folks ask me that and say, well, why aren't you guys doing anything? Well, I don't know what you would have us do. We aren't going to stand up on a box and start screaming that the DNR has done wrong when we don't know they've done wrong. I mean, what kind of precedent does that set for the next biologist who's no longer with the department that says, well, they did this wrong. Then we alter all of our wild wildlife management based on that statement and claim. Well, and earlier, you know, I mean, we, we have to, we have to kind of just just stay even keel here until the information is, is brought forward, and it will be brought forward at, at future Wolf Management Advisory Council. See, that's that's okay. That's what I was looking for. So you are confident that that this will shake out, and we will know what happened. Yes, the science and the methodology will be brought forward. Uh, that's already been a commitment made. That was a commitment made before any of this started. Um, and, and now I believe there's even going to be the auditing processes. So, you know, how that happened, um, what the process looks like. You know, it, we could be talking about a disagreement between two biologists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, we just don't know what we don't know. So I understand this is a charged topic. I understand that folks are passionate and rightfully so. We just we're, we're, we're throwing fuel to the antis right now when we keep dividing our team. And we just got to kind of, we got to back up, let the information come out, and then kind of figure out how we're going to deal with it from there. And we might be talking, well, it sounds like we're talking about just a, just a few animals. Now, I realize it does bring into question the entire process, but it doesn't look like this is something that's going to add 200 animals to our wolf population. You know, and, and that's what uh, some folks had heard from DNR staff at the meeting. Um, our executive director had heard that from DNR staff at the meeting, but nonetheless, what you kind of started with, even if, you know, if there's any activity that's not on the up and up, regardless of if it's only three or four wolves, that's still not okay. Right. Um, right. but what I'm saying is we just need to know the process. We need to know how it happened. Was it just a disagreement or was there actually some motive behind it? You know, did it happen elsewhere where other biologists counts? You know, was it happening to them? These are all things we don't know. We can't be jumping to conclusions and, and, you know, throwing people out to dry before we have all of the information. 
got you real quick, and I'm talking just a couple of seconds here. Word of COVID showing up in the Michigan deer herd. Is that something we should be concerned with? We don't know what we don't know. I mean, this, study, this, this, study affirmed, this study affirmed something we already knew. What we do with this study and moving forward is going to be the important stuff. More of that will come out in the next few months. I the theme that. for the week, Nick, we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> I apologize. I hate saying that. No, no, no. I get it. Nick Green, Chief Information Officer, MUCC. Appreciate your time. The website, MUCC.org. MUCC.org. Use the promo code MIKE, all caps, M-I-K-E. Save 25% on your membership. We'll take a break, Come back with this week's Ask Avery segment right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Cairo on WKYO. That's 1360 AM and WIDL 92.1 FM. And you can hear us in Sheboygan on Big Country Gold, WCBY, 1240 AM, 100.7 FM. The Ask Avery segment is brought to you each week by our friends from Security Credit Union. Security Credit Union loves to work with outdoorsmen and women, and they can help you with your next outdoor adventure. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. The way this uh, segment works is uh, this is your chance to uh, ask me a question. It's something you can, uh, uh, you know, want me to answer directly or, you know, pass it along to somebody else, you know, an MUCC or DNR or, you know, somebody you might not have uh, access to and maybe I do. Well, this week's question is directed uh, at me. It comes from Cody Wilbur, and he actually sent me, I think this one came through Facebook, and, and you can do that. You can reach me through uh, private messaging on any of the social media outlets, but I will admit that probably the best way to do it is to send me an email to mike at mikeavoryoutdoors.com. That's mike at mikeavoryoutdoors.com. Just because there are so many different messaging platforms and texting and everything coming at me these days, uh, if you can, uh, send it to mike at mikeavoryoutdoors.com. Here's Cody's question. He says, hey, Mike, I, I have a question. <laughs> well, obviously, that's, that's why I'm, I'm bringing it up. It's part of this week's Ask Avery segment. He says, my wife and I just bought our first used Angler Quest Pro Troll. How cool is that? Congrats on that. He said, we're loving the boat. Yep, I knew you would. But with it being three years old, the tunes, the pontoons, the tubes need some deep cleaning. He said, I was wondering if you knew of anyone uh, that cleans and polishes boats and tunes. If not, that's okay, and I appreciate your time. Now, he specifically mentions pontoons and angler quest. This would apply to any pontoon uh, or tritune or triple tube. Uh, in fact, any boats in general. I said, hey, Cody, congrats on the new Angler Quest. They're great boats for sure. Keeping those tubes clean is a chore. I said, I keep mine in a slip all summer, so about midsummer I pull it, and I have them power washed. Still, in just a few days, crud starts to grow again, and by the end of the season, they're trashed again. I told him if I was going to keep a boat for more than a couple of years, I, I, I turn mine around every year or two, I'd actually uh, get those tubes painted with bottom paint like you do on a fiberglass or an aluminum boat. Um, in the past, I've always done this. With my boats that I keep in the slip, if you have bottom paint put on them, it inhibits the growth of this crud. It doesn't prevent it, but it inhibits it. Now, does it, does it in some ways diminish the look of the boat? Yeah, you could say it does. I mean, um, but what's it better, to have, a, to have a, a neutral or an accent or a complementing color? at the water line on the bottom of your, of your boat or your tubes is, or, or to have a half inch of crud growing on it. Does bottom painting in some way affect the performance? Maybe. Maybe if it's a high-performance boat, it would take a mile or two an hour off the top end. But in my case, when I got my tubes on the Angler Quest power washed, uh, and we didn't do it at a drive through I've tried to do this before. My advice is, if you want to do a good job, don't just take it through a drive-through 
power wash on the trailer because you can't get to everything. I learned this the hard way. Brad Dupuy and I actually took an Angler Quest into a, a drive through cleaner and tried to wash it, and it didn't work very well. Get it to one of the marinas, one of the dry docks, one of the places that they can lift it up on a hoist, get underneath it and power wash it. Uh, regarding the polishing of the tubes, you know, that's a good question. I don't know of anybody, but I wondered if it might just be because I've never asked the question. Maybe maybe any marina, many, maybe any a marine shop could do this for you. Or what about an auto detailer? These people who wheel out cars and polish cars, maybe they could do your tubes too. I don't know. But yes, if you are going to keep your boat in the water, it is certainly a concern. It is certainly... Uh, especially in the southern part of the state. I mean, you get up to Lake Superior, northern Lake Michigan and such, you know, Traverse City, not as big a deal, but Lake Erie, Lake St. Clair, Saginaw Bay. Yeah, you're going to want to, you want maintaining the tubes, the tunes on a pontoon or the bottom of a boat is, is just part of keeping your boat in the water. But for me, I have found, and I've had a lot of boats over a lot of years, if I actually keep my boat in the slip, so all I have to do is drive to the marina, walk on the dock, and jump in the boat and take off, I will use it far more than if it's on a trailer behind the house and I have to take it and drive it and tow it to the ramp and fight the crowd at the ramp, especially on a holiday weekend. So for me, it's a no-brainer. I will keep my boat in the water, even dealing with the fact that I need to worry about maintaining the bottom of the boat or the tubes in the case of an angler quest. Cody, enjoy that uh, new used angler quest. I'm sure you will. And thank you to our friends at Security Credit Union for helping to make each week's Ask Avery segment possible. If you have a question for me, send me an email, mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. That's mike at mikeaveryoutdoors.com. Coming up in hour number three of this week's show, Richard P. Smith. Richard is mad at the DNR right now, and I think if I heard correctly, he's actually filed a lawsuit against them regarding UP Whitetail Management. We'll talk about that, and also, of course, how to judge Black Bear. Uh, he's a master at that. Coming up in hour number three of this week's Outdoor Magazine. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by J Sporting Goods, the Yider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons and Polarcraft Boats, the Forward Corporation, Primal Tree Stands, Shadow Hunter Blinds, Security Credit Union, Garber Chevrolet, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that uh, introduction to Hour 3 of this week's Outdoor Magazine show. Ken, uh, been the uh, voice of Outdoor Magazine for many, many years now, the radio show, also the TV show before that. So I think that's uh, uh, pretty cool. Uh, the weather's not cool right now, though, is it? I mean, I don't know what it's like as you are listening to the, my voice, but as we are recording the show, it is hot. It's muggy. It's miserable. I haven't been fishing because I've been involved in some other projects, but i got to be honest, my mindset right now, I'm starting to make the transition. Now, uh, because I'm not a, a salmon fisherman, and again, congratulations to Captain Bobby Sullivan and his uh, client, uh, Lewis, who caught a new state record king salmon out of Ludington last weekend, more than 47 pounds. How cool is that? If I was a salmon fisherman, that's where my mind would be right now. But since I don't fish salmon anymore, and since my beloved Saginaw Bay walleye fishery is slowing down, as it normally does this time of year, and because at the last minute... Ontario opened the borders. Ron St. Louis of Northern Wilderness Bear Outfitters in White River, Ontario, said he's going to have hunts, so my mind is going that direction. I'm starting to think about the fall hunting season. And I know a lot of others are as well. Richard P. Smith is an avid hunter, 
a wildlife uh, expert, a hunting expert. And I've got news now that Richard is, uh, in fact, let me, let me read the first part of a news release here. A legal challenge of the Natural, Resources Commi- Natural Resource Commission's decisions regarding UP deer hunting regulations is underway in Ingham County Circuit Car- uh, Court by a group of deer hunters organized by Marquette Outdoor writer Richard P. Smith. So, you know, that alone gets my attention. I'm thinking, well, why don't we follow up on that? And why don't we give Richard a call? And we did. And he's on our phone line now. Richard, welcome back. How are you? I'm great. I'm kind of excited and uh, uh, unsure of how things are going to turn out in the future. Well, you know, you have been an outspoken uh, critic of the DNR for years in some of the way they've done things, but I think this is the first time it's gone to this level, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's the uh, first time this has happened that um, I've been a part in initiating legal action against the Natural Resources Commission. Um, but it, in my opinion, it's overdue and very justified. Uh, we have a law in the books, uh, Proposal G, passed by 70% of the voters in 1996 that requires the Natural Resources Commission to use the best available science in making decisions. And they clearly did not do that regarding UP deer hunting uh, regulations that were recommended by the DNR. And the DNR used the best available science in making those recommendations. I'm I'm figuring a lawsuit was probably a the the uh, last straw for you, right? I mean, didn't what other methods did you try to get their attention before this? Well, not just me, but there were other people in the UP who realize uh, that deer management is not being done properly in the UP. They, we, there were efforts to get some legislative action that might reverse those decisions, but that was not successful. What specifically do you have issue with? Are there certain certain points, or is it just deer management overall? Well, there are three specific recommendations the Department of Natural Resources made uh, for changes to UP deer regulations starting this fall, uh, one of which was to eliminate uh, hunter's choice regulations in the UP, which would basically make one buck tag on combination deer license unrestricted like it was before 2008 when hunter's choice regulations were adopted. And the other two regulations uh, regarding archery hunting, uh, antlerless deer are not legal UP-wide for bow hunters like they were prior to 2015. The DNR recommended that that Analyst deer be legal for bow hunters again, and they also recommended that crossbows be legal for UP hunters during the late archery season in December. And biologically, there's no reason why any of those recommendations should not have been adopted. I do want to make sure I understand here, so I'm going to go through this again. So the so the DNR is behind these things, made recommendations to the NRC, and the NRC said no. Correct. That's it. What What is the relationship between the DNR and NRC? Help us uh, understand how that's supposed to work, Richard. Well, the NRC is a politically appointed body. It's supposed to be seven people. But for much of this year, there's only been five members on the Natural Resources Commission instead of seven. And the, these people are appointed by the governor, uh, so their political connections but the Natural Resources Commission is responsible for adopting policy for the Department of Natural Resources. So the DNR makes recommendations that the NRC is supposed to either approve or reject. And these UP deer regulations, they rejected without any basis in sound biology. Can the DNR make decisions on their own and get them enacted, or does everything have to go through the NRC? Everything has to go through the NRC. So, so you filed this suit in Ingham County, which is which is Lansing, which is where they're based. Um, I, I mean, what's next? Do you know a timetable on this? I mean, have you have you? Is it new enough where you've received a response on this yet? Do you do you expect a response? 
I, I expect a response, but according to my attorney with uh, Miller Johnson in Grand Rapids, uh, we're asking, requesting that we be allowed to appeal those NRC decisions. That's the first step. And according to my attorney, the Department or the Natural Resources Commission or the, a lawyer for the Natural Resources Commission has 21 days to respond to that request for an appeal. I, uh, I, I, don't, under, I don't pretend to understand legal issues. I mean, in, in my family, my, my, my daughter is the lawyer. It's not me. But um, I had thought that you could not sue a government agency, that they were protected from such things, no? Well, right, right now, Mike, let's clarify, we're, we're appealing the natural resources decisions we're not currently suing gotcha. the Natural Resources okay. Commission. Okay. So there's a difference there. Yep, yep. Um, this isn't going to be a cheap effort, Richard. I mean, you're, you, all right, so you're not suing them, but you're getting into a legal battle with a government entity. That's, that's do you feel like David and Goliath here? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and that's why I've started a GoFundMe page. And I also want to clarify that I'm taking this action to represent the, a group of deer hunters called Deer Hunters for Responsible UP Deer Management is the group I'm representing that I've started this legal action on behalf of this group of deer hunters who want to see better deer management in the UP. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you're, I don't want to say you're the front man, but you're, you're the, the point guy. Yeah. Okay. Well, Richard, I, uh, I would ask you to keep us informed on how this goes. I think this is very interesting that it's gotten to the point where you think this is, this was the, this was the, the, the action you had to take. Yeah. I didn't see any other avenue available at this point. Uh, it, and it, it really was frustrating and disturbing to me. I thought when the DNR made these recommendations, clearly based on evidence, uh, the hunter's choice regulations are certainly not working. The purpose of those regulations was to increase the number of adult bucks in the population. The, the number of adult bucks are, have gone down in the harvest since these regulations have been adopted. They've not increased. They're not accomplishing their purpose. And in fact, they're resulting in trying to carry too many deer through severe winters so we lose more deer during the winter uh, because of these regulations. It's terrible management. I hate to oversimplify, but does it come down to downstate people not understanding how to manage the UP deer herd? No, that, unfortunately, that isn't, it's not that simple. The, the amendments to the DNR recommendations were actually made by the two UP residents ah. who are on the Natural Resources Commission. Ah. <laughs> so, 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 so is it all politics? It's mostly politics okay. and social science rather than biological science. I got you. That's what's involved. All right. Hang tight, Richard. We've got to take a break. We're talking with the outdoor writer and now legal activist, <laughs> Richard P. Smith. His website is richardpsmith.com, richardpsmith.com. I, I find this um, very interesting. And like Richard, although you know, obviously not to the extent that Richard, you know, curious and, and interested to see how this is going to, to come out here. Um, it will be interesting. So, interesting, but we've got to take a break here. When we come back, we'll 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 wrap up this part of the conversation. But I also want to talk with Richard while we have him about the upcoming bear hunting season. Uh, Richard knows more about uh, hunting black bears than anybody I know. I've learned so much about bear hunting from him, and we'll see what else is on his mind. And of course, after that, we'll wrap it all up with wild game chef extraordinaire Dave Miner. Uh, Oscar and Joey's is now open, a uh, limited number of days. We'll talk about that and more. Coming up in Hour 3 of Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Flint on Sports Extra 1330 WTRX. 
And you can hear us in Houghton Lake on two stations, the Twister 92.1 WTWS. In Powerhouse Station, 98.5 WUPS. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Reader Landscaping. Reader can take care of your pro, uh, lawn and property because it's your nature and our nurture. Let Reader create an outdoor getaway in your backyard as they have for me. Let them maintain that getaway, maintain your property, maintain your shrubs, maintain your trees, your grass, uh, the full complement, or just pick and choose what it is that you need. For example, I used to have them mow my lawn and do everything else. These days, I want to mow it behind a push mower to get the exercise, so I take care of that, but I still have the folks at Reader come in and do a lot of the uh, spraying and the fertilizing and such. Check them out online at ReaderLandscaping.com. That's R-E-D-E-R, ReaderLandscaping.com. Uh, we're talking now with Richard P. Smith. His website, RichardPSmith.com, RichardPSmith.com. Uh, Richard, will you be downstate for the Woods and Water News Outdoor Weekend coming up in September? Yes, I will be. I think ha- since they couldn't have that last year, I'm expecting a pretty a pretty big and enthusiastic crowd there this year, you think? I'm hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I wanted to, you mentioned a GoFundMe page to to help support this effort that you're involved in. I, I, I'm not sure how this works. How do you find this? How do you get involved in this? Well, there's a link in the news release to the GoFundMe page. Um, I have it on my Facebook page. If you could put it on your Facebook page, that would be helpful. All right, I'm going to pull this up right now here. Uh, it's toward the end of the release. Okay. Okay. Okay, it says, uh, oh, you just go, okay, you go to a, there's a GoFundMe page, and then you do a search for you, but yeah, there's a specific link here. Okay. There's yeah. a specific link that'll take you right to the page. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. All right, so for folks who are interested in helping out there, that's how you can uh, do more on that. Hey, Richard, as long as I've got you here, though, I thought with bear season coming up, I mean, you know how much respect I have for you and and uh, and your expertise in bear. Let's talk about that a little bit. You got another tag this year, didn't you? Yes, I did. <laughs> Every year? Uh, yeah, it has been for <laughs> quite a few years in a row now. So. And that's by putting in for the third season, correct? Exactly. And it, it's in the Berga unit, and the Berga unit has a, a healthy number of tags for the third hunt, even though the number of tags have declined somewhat in that unit. There's still enough that I managed to draw. And there's a group of friends I hunt with, too, and they also drew by applying for that third hunt. Well, I learned that trick from you, and so last year I applied for the Newberry District third season. I got the tag. This year I didn't get it, but it looks to me like I'm going to be able to get one every other year just by going to that third season. So that's, that's, that's great advice for people. If you don't want to wait 8, 9, 10, 15 years to go hunting, just apply for the third season if it's available. Yeah, exactly. Does the third season... I mean, are you giving up some prime hunting, or doesn't really does it not matter? It doesn't matter as long as you have, if you're hunting with bait, uh, if you're hunting in locations that are less likely to be disturbed during the uh, first part of September. The third hunt doesn't start until September 25th. Uh, And we've been fortunate in having locations where we can hunt on the 25th, and there isn't much disturbance of the baits. And... uh, we see we see bears and usually have good success. Last fall is the first time in years that I did not shoot a bear. I had plenty of bears on my baits, but they were coming in after dark. Part of the reason for that is we had an excellent acorn crop mm. last year. Uh, when they have available natural foods, they usually prefer those over baits and will feed during the daytime on natural food and go to baits after dark. You mentioned something a minute ago about the number of tags. Um, Are you satisfied with the number of tags we have out there? Should there be more? Should there be fewer uh, Michigan bear tags? There should be far more in the Upper Peninsula than there currently are. And and I've been harping on that for years. Um, We, The DNR is underestimating the number of bears we have. You look at Wisconsin and Minnesota, they're harvesting two to three times more bears than we are. Because they're issuing more permits, and they have more, and they have bears, but we have almost as many bears as they do. 
Well, I, I think part of it is the Michigan Bear Hunters Association, and I, I support that group, but they've come out the last few years and said, look, at, no, we don't want an increased number of tags. That's got to play a role. It does. It certainly does. Uh, there's politics involved in bear management, just like deer management. But, Richard, we, pr- we approved Proposal G, Sound <laughs> Scientific Wildlife Management. If it was used all the time, we wouldn't have these problems. <laughs> And I will admit, I, I was a huge proponent of that. I thought this is going to solve all of our problems, but I, I didn't take the, the human aspect into account, I guess. And part of the problem, Mike, is that no one has called the Natural Resources Commission on not following Proposal G previously. Uh, so it's about time that's done. Well, like I said, I'll be very curious to see uh, how your... How your quest to do so does that. Let's go back to bear hunting for a minute. Uh, biggest challenge I've seen in bear hunting, number one, is if you're, if you're in an area with bears and you get them into your baits, that's number one. And then number two is judging the size of these things. I, I'm still fascinated by, by field judging bear, and you're an expert at it. Yeah, and I, I produced a DVD on it, as you're aware, called Field Judging Black Bears. That's been helpful for many hunters in in helping them judge whether they're seeing a male or female or whether they're seeing a small, average, or large bear. There are a number of easy techniques that are covered on that DVD that will help hunters do it. Real basic. Head size, body size, shape. I mean, what are you, what are you looking at first? A body size and shape and the head configuration as well. Males are always larger than females in, in adults. But even in young males, they have huge feet on young males compared to uh, f- females. Young females will have small front feet. Uh, on small bears, the ears look large in proportion to the size of the head, and they're closer together. As bears grow in size and age, the ears grow farther apart. On adult males, trophy class male black bears, the ears will look like they're on the sides of the head and be farther apart. And males will be longer body-wise from head to tail than females. So they'll usually be over five foot in length from nose to tail. Females will be less than five feet in length from nose to tail. And they have shorter legs on females also than males. Males have longer bodies, longer legs. Uh, those features are key in determining differences between males and females. And you can probably at this point pick up on that right away. It, it, once I get a clear view of a bear, when you only see bits and pieces of a bear as it's approaching through the woods, it's difficult to make a clear Uh, determination of what it is. But once you see it in the open and have a clear view, yeah, I can usually tell most of the time whether it's a male or female. So if you get a bear come in and it's like it's got long legs and it looks like it's got huge front feet, that's probably a young male. Without a doubt, with those features. Huh. Another key feature on the head uh, is to look at the distance between the ears and the nose. On uh, females and young males, The distance between the ears to the nose will be much longer than the distance between the ears. When you get an adult male, the distance between the ears and from the ears to the nose is almost equal. Now, we're talking about, uh, um, you know, judging the size of an animal, but also sexing an animal. If, If in Michigan, if a nice sow comes in and she doesn't have cubs, that's a legal target, right? Sure, certainly. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with shooting an adult female that does not have cubs. We have laws that protect females in the company of cubs, and and those cubs are protected as well. Okay, oftentimes in the outdoors, there there's a distinction. Something might be legal, but it's looked down on in a particular community. It, it, you, you said this, but I want to follow up on it. No shame in shooting a, a lone, single, adult female bear? Exactly, and I've done so myself. You know, there's nothing wrong with it at all. I prefer shooting adult males, but sometimes I don't get a chance at an adult male. Mm-hmm. If if she's if you find if you got a sow with cubs in the area, is it like deer hunting? Will will oftentimes the fawns come in first? Will you see the little? Will you see the cubs come in before the mom will? Sometimes, uh, sometimes the cubs will run into a bait, anxious to start feeding, and get there ahead of the female. 
but if you see two or more bears that are small in size together, those are almost always cubs because uh, once bears are yearlings and older, they're normally traveling alone by themselves. So you see more than one small bear together. It's typical that they're cubs. The female will then follow them in. Occasionally, females will get there first and the cubs will follow her. So if you see a lone bear that you suspect is a female, it's a good idea to wait a minute or two to see Hold if it show up. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You, you were talking about the third season, too. I'm going to go back to that. September 25th. Now, that means that you could be out there in the woods in the UP uh, hunting over bait during a deer season as well. Is Does it ever happen that you're sitting on a bear bait? Do, do, do bears and deer ever feed on the same bait? Most definitely. <laughs> Uh, it's not unusual to have bears come to a deer bait. It's it's common, in fact. We have so many bears now. Um, even into November gun season, I've had bears on deer baits in the UP. Hmm. Well, that would make for a fun night, white tails and bears. Right. But, of course, you can't shoot a deer with a bow until October 1st. Right, right, right. But I was thinking in the third season, and if you don't kill in the first few days, you may well be out there in October. Sure, sure. What's your, what are you going to be using for bear hunting this fall, Richard? Probably my uh, ultimate firearms muzzleloader. I usually use that and have good success with it. You've had great success with that, haven't you? Yes, I have. I've taken many bears, including several Boone and Crockett. Uh, caliber bears with that muzzle on Richard, always a pleasure. Thanks for bringing us up to speed on this legal action against the NRC. I will put a link to your uh, GoFundMe page on my uh, Facebook page. And uh, please keep us informed and let us know how it's going. Will do. Thanks a lot, Mike. And good luck in the bear, uh, bear woods this fall, too. And good luck, too, if you make it to Ontario. I am. Well, if the border's open, I'm going, that's for sure. Uh, Richard P. Smith, is, uh, his website is richardpsmith.com, richardpsmith.com. We'll take a break here on the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, a couple of more things I want to follow up on. And then, of course, we'll uh, turn our attention to some wild game cooking and wrap up the show with wild game chef extraordinaire Dave Miner. My name is Mike Avery. The website is MikeAveryOutdoors.com. My email address is Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. A quick break, and we will be right back. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Holland on WHTC, AM and FM, 1450 AM, 99.7 FM. You can hear us in Lansing on WILS, 1320 AM. You can hear us in Manistee on WMLQ, 97.7 FM. You can hear us in Ludington, where that new state record king was caught last weekend on News 97, 98, 98.7 WLDN. Did I say Lansing, W-I-L-S, 1320? I think I did. And, boy, I forgot. I, I got a slow start. Port here on WPHM, 1380. And in Saginaw, on WSGW AM and FM, 790 AM, 100.5 FM. I am in the studios of WSGW right now. But for this three hours, this little tiny corner of the building is called the Outdoor Magazine Studio. And I have a sign behind me to prove it. In here with me, Charlie Rood as he turns once again to wave to the adoring crowds, and he shows off his wound on his arm. There's a story there. He got in a fight with a bear. And I'll, I'll let you uh, look that one up online. Charlie Rude injury. You'll find it. You'll find it. Uh, this segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by my friends at Wilds Plumbing and Heating. Plumbing, heating, air conditioning, sump pumps, ductwork, cleaning, you name it. In fact, the latest job they did for me, we had uh, a three-season room, and we basically turned it into just another room of the house. We're calling it the back room now. But we have a, a, a unit in that room that is a, a combination heater and air conditioning unit, and we had to pull it off the wall to put up some shiplap and do some, some work in that room. So I was thinking we could just pull it off the wall. I checked with my friends at Wiles, and they said, it's a little more complicated than that. Why don't you have our guys come out and do it? And when I saw what was involved in getting that off the uh, wall, 
unhooked and back up, I am glad I let the experts do it. Sometimes you just got to bring in the pros, and the folks at Wilds are pros. Whatever it takes is their motto, and I think they've and I think they have proven that to me over many, many years. Check them out online at wildsplumbingandheating.com. That's wildsplumbingandheating.com. It will be interesting to see what kind of traction Richard P. Smith gets with his legal action against the NRC, the Natural Resources Commission. I will uh, uh, put uh, his news release and a link to his GoFundMe page on my Facebook page as well. Um, I am getting ready for an Ontario bear hunt here. It's coming up in just a couple of weeks. As part of that, I picked up a Darton crossbow this past, well, a couple of days ago. I got a, a Darton Toxin 150RD. I haven't shot dart and crossbows for the last couple of years, and I will tell you this bow is like a giant leap ahead of what I'm used to from dart. And I was used to a pretty high standard before. But in the past, I've shot the 100 and the 135. I really I haven't, uh, I don't know if I've ever hunted with their 150, and this 150 is bigger and better. I think it's got something like a... 220 pound draw this is not a beginner's crossbow 440 feet per second and after shooting a recurve for the last couple of years i will be honest it was a little bit intimidating to have that much power resting in my hands in front of my face but i know the folks at darton to be very safety conscious very good engineers, and uh, I trust their design work. I trust their construction. These bows are made in Michigan, by the way, which is why I wanted to shoot a Darton. Very, very impressive, especially, again, after shooting a recurve at like 190 feet per second, 440 feet per second. I was shooting, I was shooting bullseyes at 50 yards after about six shots. Now, you might say, well, that's, <laughs> Charlie, look at this. I, you could have predicted that, couldn't you? <laughs> A little private joke here. Um, <laughs> you might say, well, that's taking the easy way out. That's the lazy man's way. And, and I got to be honest with you, I really can't argue with that. After a half a dozen shots, 10 shots or whatever, I can shoot a bullseye at 50 yards with this dart and toxin crossbow. I wouldn't shoot an animal that far, but on a target, I can shoot a bullseye at 50 yards. It took me hours and hours and hours of shooting a recurve to become proficient where I felt that I could consistently hit near the center of the target at 15 yards. So yeah, it, it is a different ball game. But as I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, it just got to the point where I wasn't spending the time with the recurve that I should have been, that it was necessary to feel confident. And I think when you head into the woods, you owe it to the game you're pursuing to have as good of odds you can, as good a chance as making a quick, clean, humane killing shot. And if that crossbow will allow me to do that, then what's the downside? There is none. Okay, so it's easier to become proficient with. It's easier to make a little bit longer range shot. You don't have to put the time into it. Okay, all right. Is it as hardcore as a recurve? No. Is it as beautiful and simple and basic as a recurve? No. Is it heavier than a, uh, a recurve? Yes. But is it more accurate? Tremendously so. And I'm actually kind of excited about about the opportunity to shoot a, a dart and crossbow again. I'll have more coming up here over the next few few weeks. Dave Miner coming up after the break, I think, right here on Outdoor Magazine.
Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. My name is Mike Avery, also known as the Big Guy, and so glad to have you along with us. You know, as I'm sitting here in the studio right now, uh, there was uh, storms that came across the state last night. And some parts of the state really got hammered. Um, but I, I, my wife and I both, we, we slept right through them. Either they either went around us last night and we just didn't get hit by them, or we were so tired last night we just slept through it. But fortunately, um, either way, there was, there was no damage around my neighborhood. But a lot of my friends are uh, dealing with uh, downed trees and no power. And boy, when it's this hot and muggy, you don't, want, you don't want to be without power, do you? Wild Game Chef Dave Miner is uh, one of those people who got hit by those storms. He doesn't have any power. He's got some trees to clean up. I don't know if we can get a cell signal out of his place up north, but we're going to give it a try. David, can you hear me? My <laughs> Uh, that lets me know that you can hear me and I can hear you, but I don't think it's going to work, Dave. Give me a little bit more. Let's see if we can make this work. Okay, I can, if I can't hear right here, is any better? That's a little bit better. How you doing, Dave? You okay? Oh, oh yeah, we got um, some storm down up here in Spanish. Uh, we won't have power sometime um, tomorrow evening after well, I, I tell you what, Dave, our, our signal is not good enough to have a conversation. So, so you're off the hook there. But I will tell people that Oscar and Joey's is back up on a limited basis, I think Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and they can find your hours online. Um, but we're just not going to be able to do a, a, a recipe or any kind of tips today, okay? Mother Nature wasn't good for us. Mother Nature was not good for you. I got that much. I'll let you go. I'll let you get back to cleaning things up. Mother Nature, isn't she something? She can be a witch. She can be much stronger term than that, too. And I've always said that that's one of the things that I, I find most interesting about this outdoor lifestyle that many of us love so much. Mother Nature always wins. She always wins. Even in today's technologically advanced and aware and astute world where all so often or in our day-to-day -day lives we, we press a button or we click a key or we swipe a finger and there's an immediate response and the device in our hands or the internet connection or whatever always does exactly, usually does exactly what we want. You get outdoors and everything changes. You're at the mercy of Mother Nature. You're at the mercy of the critters that you're pursuing. You're at the mercy of the fish that you're after. And to me, that's one of the big appeals of this outdoor lifestyle. And for me personally, and I think for us as a group, it's good to be reminded that we are not ultimately at the top of this, I don't want to say the food chain because we are at the top of the food chain, but we're not, we're not the ultimate authority in this world that we live in. Even if we are in our day-to-day -day world, in our offices or in our plant or whatever, when you get outdoors, things change. You can't control the weather. You can't control the wind speed. You can't control the wind direction. You can't control the, control the temperature. You can't control the humidity. You can't control the rain. You can't control the snow. You just have to deal with it. But again, that's part of the appeal is having to adapt and deal with what Mother Nature throws at you. And sometimes she is indeed a witch. And then even if Mother Nature cooperates... And I'm talking about moon phases and all this other stuff, too, depending on how involved you want to get. Then, if you're out there on a hunting or fishing adventure, you add another layer of complexity to it. Okay, so Mother Nature lets you get on the water. The wind is just right. The chop is just right. It's a beautiful day. It's not too hot. The bugs aren't too bad. You're enjoying your time on the water. Well, then you got to get the fish to cooperate. Or you're out in the whitetail woods or the uh, upland bird uh, woods. Just being out there doesn't mean 
that you're going to be successful in putting fish or game in the freezer or on the table. But as long as we remember that that part of it is not the key to success, shooting or catching something is not what makes a successful outdoor adventure. I always say it's the experience that is the experience. It's just getting out there and having the opportunity and knowing that maybe you're going to catch a big fish, maybe you're going to shoot a big buck, whatever it is. But maybe not. Probably not. But if you still enjoy the experience and enjoy the adventure and keep a positive mindset, it's all good. Regardless of what Mother Nature does to us. And if you are, uh, hopefully by the time you hear this show, if you did get pounded by those storms last night, hopefully you've got things cleaned up and your power is back on. I certainly hope that for you. Uh, my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. The email address, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. I would encourage you to join me on the social media outlets, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. I do a Wednesday night live every Wednesday night at 7. I do a behind the mic show every Wednesday morning at 845. Hope you get a chance to check those out. Hope you get a chance to uh, spend some quality time outdoors. Summertime is running down. Get out there and enjoy it, and I will talk with you next time right here on Outdoor Magazine.